shortest path node is the newest hive in geometry nodes. It connects two points in space via the shortest path. In theory, this sounds very simple. However, if you start tinkering around with it, you'll notice that it's actually not that easy. So in this video, I'll show you how to use this amazing new node. In this video, I'm using Blender 3.4 Alpha. All right, so I have a fresh scene over here. Let's just go ahead and delete everything for starters. And I'm gonna import a model that I'm gonna work with. It's a human head model, and I will put a link down in the description where you can download this model for free. All right, so let's hide our mesh here, add in a plane object, which we'll use to create our geometry nodes system. So with the plane selected, let's hit new, and let's start working on our geometry. So we don't need this group input node, but we are going to add in a object info node. Now what this does, if we plug it into the group output, it will allow us to select any object which we have in our outliner here and use that as the input for our geometry. So in this case, I'm gonna select human head here, and there you have it. It's now the active object in our geometry nodes. Now this effect relies on three nodes in geometry nodes that are all called something with edge. So I'm going to look up edge here. And in this case, what I want is the shortest edge paths node, edge paths to curve node, and I need the edge vertices node. So first of all, we are going to take this node and plug it in between. Now what this does is it will take our mesh, our geometry input in this case, and turn it into curves. There's no data plugged into this node yet, so Blender doesn't know what to do with it. So for now, it will just remove the entire mesh in our scene. To give it data, we are going to need this node over here called the shortest edge paths node. And we we can take this next vertex index and plug it into the next vertex index on the edge paths here. Still nothing is happening and that's because we have not defined any parameters for the shortest edge path node. So what I want to do is I want to create a start point and a end point for the effect so we can actually control this. Now there's a ton of ways of doing this but what I want to achieve is to actually get two empties to control this effect so we can easily control it. So what I'm going to do up here is I'm going to add in two sphere empties, there you have them, and I'm gonna call one end and one start. And we are going to plug in both of these. So again, we'll need two more object info nodes. So let's duplicate this object info node with shift D and do it once more. And in this case, let's select both the end empty and the start empty. So we now have these two empties and we can take this location data, which will tell geometry nodes wherever this object is, and we can plug it into the end vertex or the start vertex. And let's take this one, plug it in there and nothing happens because this is vector data. It doesn't convert well because this is a Boolean value. So we need to fix that. Now I'm going to take this start thing over here and I'm going to connect it to the start vertices using some extra nodes. Take a position node and a vector math node, which we are going to set to distance. There it is, distance. Now we have two vector inputs here. So we take the location and we take the position and it will decide the distance between the original position and the location currently. This will give us a value which tells geometry nodes that the object is actually moving in our scene. So if we now take this value, we plug it in here, still nothing happens. Okay, so why is that? That's because this value is still not useful as a Boolean. I'm gonna take a compare node here and the result can go in there. Set this to be a integer, take the distance, plug it into the A and leave this at zero and set it to equal. That's fine for now. We can tinker around a little bit with that later on. Now let's do the same for this value over here. So I'm just gonna copy these three nodes, shift D, duplicate it, and let's make sure we actually plug everything in here. So location into this, equal, and there you go. And we didn't need to duplicate that one. Now you might think nothing's visible still, and that's because both of these empties are still in their original position. But if I start moving them around and just pull this guy back, what I think works a little bit better for this mesh in this case is to change this compare node from equal to not equal, which will give us a more straightforward look. But as you can tell, we can still control the overall effect of how this node works. It starts from here and then it goes all the way to here looking for the shortest path. Now, because I want to keep my scenes a little bit clean, I'm just going to take all of these nodes here and then hit control J to actually put a frame around all of them. Let's label it something like shortest path. Now we also have our object info here and we still have this edge vertices node. That's because we still have this open socket here called edge cost. With this, we can define a value which Blender uses to find the shortest path. Difference in values here will change the way these paths move along our object. 
I'm going to use the edge vertices for this one, but you could also just plug in a random value, for example, and you'll get a completely different result. If you start changing this value, stuff changes as well. But in this case, I'm going to use the edge vertices node. Again, I'm going to take a vector math node here, which is still set to distance. And I'm going to take the position one and position two data. Now, these are the position one and position two of each vertex in our point. So these are position one and position two of the vertices on every edge in our model. So it gives us a distance. And in this case, the distance um, should be the shortest possible. So if we plug this into the edge cost, you will see that we now get all of the shortest lines possible towards the end goal. Here. This is now exactly what you expect from the shortest path. You get a start point, you get an end point, and Blender looks for the shortest path in between each of them. What we can do next is we can actually create a bit more of an interesting geometry. So I'm going to take a merge by distance node and plug that in between here on our geometry. So with the merge by distance node, we can create a bit more interesting geometry. However, we lack a little bit of geometry to actually merge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a subdivision surface node here, set it to two. This is before this is after so way more interesting just by adding a little bit more geometry to work with so we have these three nodes here i'm gonna select all of these hit Control j and frame them to make sure that this is our what you might have noticed i've switched around these two so it, before this one was over here and this one was over and what you get then is that all of these lines they start moving in the opposite direction so they are now going towards the back of the head instead of towards the front so in this case let's move the end point to the back the start point to the front and let's just decide where to position these so we get a good look so what we have now is a bunch of curves and we need to make sure that we can actually visualize these and give them a nice look first of all however i think these are all super jagged curves and I want to make them nice and smooth. So what I want to do is I want to add in two nodes to make them smooth. It's actually very, very simple. First of all, it's called the set spline type. Let's make sure it's set to Bezier. And the next one is called set handle type. Now, if we just take that one, set it to auto, we now get a bunch of nicely smoothed curves. Final step for this thing though, is I want to edit a trim curve node. And this is where the real cool stuff happens. If we now take this start value and we start cranking it up or to cranking it down, you can see we can animate all of these lines going across. And I think that's super, super awesome. All right, so let's take these three nodes, hit control J again, and let's label this guy as smoothing and animation. So we know now that if we want to keyframe something, we can use this trim curve in this group over here. Final step for this setup is to actually create something to see. We now have curves here, yeah? And what we want to do is we want to turn these curves into a mesh and then turn that mesh point. There's actually two nodes for that. So first of all, let's take the curve to mesh node, plug it in there and we now have a mesh instead of curves. We don't need a profile curve like we usually use, but instead we'll use a mesh to points node. There it is. Now points are something that only works within cycles. So while we're at it, let's change the render engine from EV to cycles. Now, if I go back to solid view here, you'll see that we have a million of these very big points. We can change the radius here, obviously, and make it look a little bit better. But I want to control the overall density and mainly the overall skill for each of these points. This radius value needs to change depending on where they are on their curve. Now, we can just take a map range node, plug that in here, and let's set the max value to be 0.01 and the minimum value to be zero. Now we need some value to actually control where this is going. And what we usually do when we want to define the length of something, so we have a spline and we want to know uh, what the value is over here, the value here and the value here. What we'll usually do is we'll just take a spline parameter node and we plug the factor into this value. Now, if we do this for this one, you'll notice we aren't getting anything. And I'll explain why that is, that's because this uses the latest geometry input here. So what it looks at this spline parameter is this mesh output here. Now this mesh is not a curve, so it's not a spline. So it doesn't have any of this spline data. So what we need instead is we need the data from this trim curve node. So this is still a spline, it's animated because we can actually change this value. So the data changes as well, which is exactly what we need 
to define the skill of all of these points. So I need to capture this attribute. Like I said, capture an attribute. There's luckily a node for that. So let's plug that in between here. So let's take this spline parameter node and take the factor, which is what we want to capture and plug that into the value. Now we have captured this float data because it's set to float. So that's just all gray data. Float values are gray values. And we can just take this attribute and plug it into the value of the map range. And voila, there you get it. We now have points going from 0 to 0 0.01 at the beginning there. So depending on the trim curve length here, and if we create a simple animation, so over here, let's set it to the timeline and let's take the start value here, set it to one and hit I while hovering over that and then go over here to frame 90 or so and set it to zero and hit I again. We now play this back. We should be getting a nice animation of all of these points fitting in. Now, the final thing I want to do with this map range though, is I want to have a bit more control over it. So I'm going to add in this super awesome node called a float curve node. If you plug this in between, nothing should change because we are now using a completely linear float curve. So what I want is I want the fall off to be a little less gradual. So over here we have these very small points and over here we have the big points and I want them to stay bigger longer. So I'm going to take this curve and just see whatever it does. And if I should go this way, no, that doesn't look good. It appears I need to go this way, maybe even like that. I'm going to go set it to something like that which is fine. Yep, that works for me. And we just need to make them smaller overall. So instead of 0.01, I'm going to use 0.001. And there you go. We now get a nice look going from here to here. And the shape overall is just slightly more interesting to look at. So we have all of these nodes. I'm just going to keep these two together so we can actually tell that this is just a separate part where we capture this data. I'm going to select all four of these, hit Control J again, and let's make sure we actually name this guy and call this mesh two points. So we now have a clear overview of what everything does. And our final step, obviously, is to take a material node, set a material. Let's just plug that in between. Let's define a material. So let's call it something like points selected in our geometry node system. Very important. Lots of you forget this step and then message me saying, oh, no, there's no material well select the material in the geometry nodes system and it should work just fine go into rendered view and for the material i'm just going to keep it very very basic just add a emission shader make it white and finally let's take our world shader and make it black now this is practically all i did and i just added in a camera give it a depth of field let's go into camera view here depth of field you know set this all the way down until you get something cool maybe zoom it in a little bit and let's just make sure that one part is in focus and the other part is not. So that's how you use the shortest path node in the new and upcoming versions of Blender. Now there's so much more that you can do with it. You can get real fancy with it, create smart systems in which objects move through a city or through a mountain range, define where roads should be and not should be. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it, but it's all way more advanced. So in this video, I just showed you how to use it in its most simple form, but you can still generate a very, very cool results with it. The project file for this video is available on the Patreon as always, as are over 50 other project files. So please consider becoming a patron just like all of these amazing people up here. It really helps the channel out a lot. Now, did you know there are so many amazing things you can do in Blender that most people don't even know? Well, check out this video over here and see all of the things that you can do in Blender.